Hey guys, Laura Whitmore here with STP, and I've been a test prep instructor for over 16 years. I super score a 1570 on the SAT, and I am here today to help you get the best score you possibly can on the upcoming October test. This test is super important because a lot of seniors, it's their last test that they can take. So are you applying early decision or early action? I would love to hear what your situation is. Is this your last test? Comment below last test. If this is the last test you can take before applications are due. I also would love to hear where you're applying, what your dream school is and what kind of score you need to get to get in there. So that being said, um, this video is going to walk you guys through the top nine predictions of concepts that I am confident are gonna end up on this October test. Because I'm a test prep coach, I'm constantly analyzing trends and I'm constantly looking at the problems that are released to see what College Board is testing right now. So throw away your old practice books. Let me tell you, they are useless. Those problems are old and outdated and make sure you watch this video all the way from the start to the end. Definitely stick around to the end because after my nine predictions, I'm going to give you six quick tips so that you can get a perfect score on the math. And before we get started, if you're new to my channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button below so you don't miss out on future content from me to help you land the SAT score you need. All right, guys, before we get started, this video is brought to you by Preply, the digital SAT prep app that's available in the App Store and in Google Play. So if you don't feel like taking a full digital SAT test on College Board's Blue Book or some other platform, Preply is perfect for you. You can do what you want, when you want, where you want from the palm of your hand. So if you just wanna practice like 10 questions or just do a little bit of daily practice each day, Preply is perfect for you. We continue to add in exclusive questions in both the English and the math, and Preply now features your own personal digital AI SAT tutor named Wisby. So go check Preply out today. Let's start with prediction number one. If you're taking the paper test, it is going to be an old historical hug slug. So as you can see, the hug slug is the two passages back to back. I call it a hug slug because you want to figure out if the authors would hug each other or slug each other when you're done. They definitely slug if it's an old historical hug slug, so be ready for them to disagree. So if you need help with reading, I would say grab as many tests that you can find that have a historical hug slug and practice those. And check out some of my reading videos, especially answer seeking. It's a great strategy where you don't have to read the passages at all and you can still get an awesome score. All right, prediction number two. I think that College Board is gonna ask you how to interpret a function. So do this annotating strategy, it's really helpful to me. When I see um, an equation and then I see a bunch of English underneath, I wanna synthesize all of that because it's hard to keep track of what's going on when I have information in two different places. So it says, the function G models the quantity in milliliters of the chemical substance remaining, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna annotate G is the quantity in milliliters of a chemical substance. Okay, and then they said it's T days after it is initially measured, so T days after measured. Now I have my annotations right up on the function and I can easily answer the question. When they wanna know something like, well, what's the interpretation of G of three equals 0.8? I know three is my X. And since T is my X in that function, three stands for days. So I don't want 0.8 days and I don't want 0.8 days. I'm gonna go with B or D. Now this is my G. G of T pops out a 0.8, so that's gonna be in milliliters. So I wanna find one that says milliliters. 
Now, when I'm down to B and D, they both say milliliters. So we have to figure out, well, what is G of T measuring? It's measuring the quantity remaining. So the quantity is going to be 0.8 milliliters. It's not decreasing by that because G is not measuring a decrease amount. It's just measuring how much there is left. All right, on to prediction number three. In some of my other predictions videos, I have covered how to know the difference between no solution, infinitely many solutions, and one solution with systems of equations algebraically. But I think that this test, they're gonna test you on that graphically. So let's kind of run through your scenarios. If you have a no solution linear system of equations, graphically, it's going to look like parallel lines. Obviously, if they don't intersect, there is no solution. If it's an infinitely many system, when you graph it, there will be just one line because the line is the same. If it's one solution, when you go to graph it, you'll have them cross at exactly one point. Never pick an answer for a linear system that says two solutions. Because guys, lines can't cross at more than one point. They're not curved. Now, they may give you a curveball and give you a three equation system. So let me show you this picture right here. So they'll ask you how many solutions are there to the three equation system. Don't let them trick you. Just because this is intersecting with that and this is intersecting with that doesn't make them solutions. If there are three lines to the system, they all must cross at one point. And since they don't in this case, there's zero solutions to this. All right, prediction number four. I think they're going to test you on infinitely many with an abstract component for a system. So here's an example from a previous test. And it says in the system of equations above, A and B are constants. If the system has infinitely many solutions, what is the value of A over B? Well, just a reminder guys, algebraically, if there's infinitely many solutions, they are in proportion to each other. So if I look at the relationship between 12 and 60, I know that it's five times bigger to get to the bottom equation, okay? That being said, if I'm trying to get A, I'm gonna divide this number by five. So that means A is two fifths, and I'm gonna divide eight by five, so B is eight fifths. So if they want two fifths over eight fifths, I'll do a quick keep change flip, and I end up with one fourth. Make sure you always reduce your fractions all the way down when you're going to put them in to like a fill-in or a gridding, okay? If it's not multiple choice, you need to reduce your fractions. Here's my prediction number five. I think that they're going to give you a probability problem where there's a given. And these are a lot trickier because you've gotta be mindful of what the total amount you're selecting from is now. So in this question, it says, one of these participants will be selected at random. What is the probability of selecting a participant who prefers apples, given that the participant is at least five years of age? It's given that the participant is at least five years of age, we must eliminate the first group that's zero to four years. We will not be taking from that group at all. We're only taking from the group that's at least five years old. So then we're gonna look at the total amount of apples for five to nine and then 10 plus years because they all qualify, they're all over five years old. We have 40 apples. And then this is the tricky part. We have to make sure that our total is just the five to nine year olds and the 10 plus year olds. So that would be 120, which reduces to one third. Now onto my next prediction, prediction number six. I think that they are going to test you on a tricky, conversion problem. So they have put converting to square unit problems on the test since last school year, and it's been consistently on every test since then. So often what happens is when College Board tests something over and over and over again, then they decide to throw a curveball. So let's take a look at this problem. It says a rocket's acceleration is measured at a rate of 9.2 meters per second squared. What is this rate in kilometers per hour squared rounded to the nearest tenth? Well, usually on conversion problems, when you see squared and you know you're working in square units, 
you want to square the conversion that they give you. So normally I would square the one kilometer and then the thousand meters and make a new conversion in square kilometers and square meters. But here's the thing, we don't need the meters and kilometers squared, we need the time squared. So like, let me just demonstrate with, first I'm gonna write out this ratio. So it's a rate of 9.20 meters per second squared. Well, that looks like this, 9.20 meters per second squared. Okay, so I'm dealing with the time is squared. So if I wanna get it in per hour squared, I need to write a separate conversion off to the side. So one dimensionally, we could say that 60 seconds equals one minute. So then that would mean if we squared both sides, 3,600 seconds squared equals one minute squared, okay? But then we know that 60 minutes equals one hour. So we need to square both of those. So we've got 3,600 minutes equals, minutes squared equals one hour squared. So we're gonna have to use these square conversions to get the time to be appropriate. All right, so that being said, um, they said, what is the rate in kilometers per hour squared? Okay, let me start down here so I have a little bit more room. Okay, first let's work to convert to kilometers. I have it in meters and I want it in kilometers, so I'm gonna put meters on the bottom and kilometers on top. Okay, meters will cancel with meters, and now I have it in kilometers. Okay, now I need to work to get it from seconds squared to hours squared. So I'm going to multiply, and I'm gonna put a second squared on top because I have one on the bottom, and I'm gonna make that 3,600 seconds squared for one minute squared. All right, the seconds squared cancel with the seconds squared. Now I wanna get rid of minutes squared and get it into hours squared. So I'm gonna go ahead and multiply one more time. I'm gonna put my minutes squared on top. I have 3,600 minutes squared equals one hour squared. So now the minutes squared cancel with the minutes squared and I have my hours squared on the bottom, which is what I need. So I'm gonna multiply through straight across. So I have 9.2 times 3,600 times 3,600, and then I have to divide that by 1,000. And I end up with 119232 kilometers per hour squared. All right, now we are on to prediction number seven, determining the sum of solutions of a quadratic, or they're going to ask you how many real solutions there are of a quadratic. The past couple of tests, they asked about how many real solutions there are. So my prediction, honestly, is I think they're gonna ask for the sum of the solutions this time. So just as a reminder, you guys, if they give you a quadratic like this, you just do negative B over A, so you'll have a negative negative one over one, which gets you one, so the answer to that was C. Now, if they ask you how many real solutions there are instead, you're gonna use the discriminant. So I have B squared minus four AC, so B is negative one, so I have negative one squared minus four times one times negative 12, so I end up getting one plus Four times 12 is 48, so 49. So since it's positive, there are two solutions, okay? Just as a reminder, if it's zero, there's one solution. If the discriminant is negative, there's zero solutions. Prediction number eight, I think they're gonna test you on the complementary angles rule. This is like classic trigonometry for the SAT. It is their bread and butter when it comes to asking you something difficult for trig, and they've done it consistently for the past few years. So take a look at 23. Now, if they tell you the sine of one angle equals the cosine of the other angle, you need to know that that means those two angles are complementary. So all you need to do basically is just substitute in 
the 4K minus 22 and the 6K minus 13, and for A and B, set it equal to 90 and solve for K. You will get 12.5 when you solve for K. Do not set the angles equal to each other. That's what they want you to do. They want you to make A equal to B, not the case. They are complementary. That is the complementary angles rule. Prediction number nine. You know what's trending, you guys, is they're asking for you to give them the equation of a line after they provide you with two points. This is old school SAT, and it's just come right back up again, which is so interesting to me. So here I have an example where they might give you two points, like two, two, and four, six. Start by getting the slope using the slope equation. Now, here's a little tip. You don't wanna make a careless mistake. So I would label your points x1, y1, and x2, y2, just to be safe, to make sure you put them in the right spots. And as you can see, our slope is two. Now you have to get the B. So we know Y equals two X plus B. We need B to be the only unknown. You can't solve for a variable if there are other variables also in the equation, you're gonna be blocked. So take one of the points, like I'll take a two, two, and I'm gonna put two in for Y and I'm gonna put two in for X and I'm gonna solve for B. Ah, so B is negative two. So that means our whole equation is Y equals two X minus two. All right, guys, quick tips for you. If you want to get a perfect score like I do on the math, first off, if you have a hard problem towards the end of the section and it talks about a ball being thrown up into the air, you're gonna have to use vertex form and just know the A value is always negative 16. Second tip, don't add two percents together if they're talking about taking a couple of discounts. So if a problem says they took 25% off, then after that they took another 20% off, Guys, do not add the percents together and make it 45%. You have to do them separately or you're gonna get it wrong. All right, next tip. I want you guys, if you get to a tough geometry problem that looks pretty complicated, to just skip it and save it for last. So throw a dot next to it, keep moving. Those geometry problems are gonna take you way longer to solve. So you wanna do it with all your extra time and make sure you can grab as many points and get as many other problems correct in the meantime. All right, here's my fourth tip. Make sure when you're on section four, you use your calculator to check your computations. It's very easy to make a mistake up here in your head. So, you know, just throw everything in the calculator and just use it to spot check so you don't make a careless mistake. All right, tip number five, make sure you write out all your work. I know it's annoying to have to write minus five and minus five on both sides of an equation when you can do it in your head. But I promise you guys, it will help mitigate careless mistakes and it's so easy to do something silly when you're not writing out your work. And my last tip for you guys is if you want a perfect score, make sure you have enough time on each section to go back and check all of the math problems again. I wouldn't look at the problems and just look through them to see if you can spot a mistake. I would actually redo the entire problem from start to finish to make sure you get the same answer. The only thing that is holding you back if you are a strong math student that knows all the concepts from getting a perfect score is yourself. And making careless mistakes on this test is the easiest way to not make that goal happen. Best of luck to everyone. Study hard, happy prepping, and I'll see you guys again soon.